Good evening and welcome to Run UFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith, and every Friday it's the Three Amigos show with Mitch, Steve Hasty, and occasionally our local MP, Ian Mearns and Gateshead. How are you, lads? All right? Very well, thanks. Hi. Not bad, thank you. Good to see Something's you. Good. Con considering, considering, how it, considering how it's all gone uh, over the last 48 hours, um, it's uh, it's good to see you've all got a smile on your face anyway. I suppose you've, <laughs> you can't, if you can't laugh, you cry with Newcastle United. Uh, Mitch, come to you first, mate. Um, what a what a week. I mean, yesterday was, you know, it was comical, wasn't it? I mean, I think we went through yep. every single possible emotion from nine o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night. Yeah, and, and, and baffling, bizarre, contradictory um, statements that contradicted other statements, sometimes from the same organisation. Um, it, it, it was on, it was off, it was might be on, it might be off. Um, I, I honestly, I, the only time through this whole process I've been this confused was when a French journalist tried to get hold of us through Instagram and tell us that Benzaya Group had a bid in. And I was like, but I've lit literally spoke to Midhat 20, 20 minutes ago, and I know that's not true. And I came away from that conversation utterly confused. And I'm, this is now, this, I'm even more confused than ever. <laughs> Unbelievable. Steve, I mean, we spoke, obviously, you know, yesterday, I, I, we spoke to Mitch as well. But I mean, you know, where's your head at after the last 48 hours? Uh, I think I've turned into uh, John Lydon. I could be wrong. I could be right. You know, <laughs> I'm all over the place, honestly, quite frankly. The phone calls I've had today, the conversations I've had with people, um, the, 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 the number of people who are now analysing every word. I'm afraid to scratch my nose. I'm afraid to poke my um, ear or anything like that. <laughs> Bruce has got completely bamboozled. I, I just don't know where we stand now, Steve. Um my my heart and my head. I'm, I don't even know what's ruling what. Quite frankly, it's 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 just a maelstrom, an absolute maelstrom. Ian, I, I mean, this all happened, of course, whilst Chion Wura was bless her, was standing up in Parliament uh, trying to address the, some serious issues. Um, I, I almost felt that was timed deliberately. Uh, I, 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 I'd love to think that they thought that MPs were that important, but I, I think that's probably not the case. <laughs> uh, that's probably not this. the reason I'm smiling, by the way, Steve, is because I'm at home in Gated. Because as you know, I was in London this week, and yeah. I'm not. I just couldn't wait to get home last night. Yeah, we, we were on this. Home. We're on the same. We're on the same train. It wasn't the same London I left in March. I've got to be honest. It was quite quiet down there, and uh, not as busy. Not as busy on the on the tubes that I was on anyway, or the trains that I was on. But uh, yeah, it's it's a bit. It was a bit eerie for London. I felt, uh, Ian. Uh, I, I think the Palace of Westminster is eerie all the time. I, I mean, I refer to it as Hogwarts, you know, because it's full of public school boys. And some of them are up to sort of nefarious sort of sophistry most of the time, like so. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so it, 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 it's always a bit odd. See, the thing is with me, you know, I, I get off the train, I go straight down to the Palace of Westminster. I'm there till I have to go home to the flat. I then get up in the morning, I go to the Palace of Westminster. So what I see is, I see King's Cross, I see me flat, I see the Palace of Westminster, and, you know, not much commuting in between, you know, and, and, and very very little else. And, you know, I, I just think you get a very, very strange idea of what London's like, because I just don't see much of London at all, frankly, like. Yeah, and I could probably do a full show on what's going wrong with uh, COVID, but we'll we'll stick to Newcastle. Um, Newcastle United, honestly, if, if there's ever a club that's going to make a takeover difficulty, it's going to be us, isn't it? And um, this week has just been a monumental, you know, cock up after cock up on somebody's behalf. And, and Richard Masters coming out and doing his interview, Mike Ashley losing the plot after going for another pizza with the players. Um, you know, in amongst signing a multitude of players we never thought in a million years we were going to get, it's just been a typical week at Newcastle United. Well, I, I gather that Ashley had steak, and, and, and I, I can think of never. a good use for a steak at the minute, like it's <laughs> it, it would be in somebody's heart. Um, you know, uh, I, I just I think that, um, you know, they, they were going to it, it's, it's been an interesting week, but you see, Richard Masters, you see, has been so busy not answering my letter about getting the um. About getting the matches televised, mm -hmm. yes, you know, so, yes. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm still waiting for an, an answer to a letter that I sent on behalf of a group of MPs um, about 17 days ago. Wow, you Unbelievable. know, 
At least, at least we've got the answer that we're wanted in the end that they're going to televise the matches. But, you know, frankly, uh, you, you know, that he's a busy lad, Richard, like, you, you know, uh, schmoozing Sky News and that, like, so. Too busy on the television and, uh, yeah, being analysed by uh, body experts. Mitch, um, not sure whether you saw that one, Mitch, with uh, with uh, my good mate. What, what did you think of that? I mean, he, you know, his little 10-minute video just analysing the video. I thought it was... I thought it was quite interesting, wasn't it, to watch someone's body language and pick up whether they were telling the truth or telling lies? Absolutely, and and, it, and analysed it very, very well. I, um, I used to play a lot of poker many years ago, and reading body language is an essential key to trying to be successful at that. And, uh, um, it, it, the anal analysis of him is, is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. And, and this is the, the madness that we're at. You know, the Premier League have managed to contrive to turn this into Schrodinger's takeover. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a it's a takeover and it isn't all at the same time. Um, the, they've, they've stuck the buyers into this sort of perpetual loop by the looks mm -hmm. of things um, and then came out with this range of contradictory statements in a, in a short period of time um, that haven't helped themselves um, the, the, and it's given Mike Ashley this opportunity. Yes, he, he certainly lost the plot the other night, whether he'd had one or two more uh, birthday shandies than he'd planned or not. I've got absolutely no idea. Um, but my understanding was that, that pe people this side, the things were definitely, definitely um, not told in advance. They had a five-minute warning that this statement was coming out. Um, and for him to make the statement that he did, and then effectively the Premier League to turn around and say, no, we, have, we haven't rejected it. Um, somebody's lying, or everybody's lying. And that, it, and that just adds to the confusion, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, we've got a little bit more clarity today. I mean, uh, I've had a fair share of you of uh, a fair share of trolls. Apparently, I cannot see any of them. I block them all. So I've had a few <laughs> inboxes today from I've had a few inboxes today from people saying you're getting a bit of a pace and you're getting a bit of a coat. And so I've I worn the appropriate Morrissey T-shirt just for the trolls. And I have got a troll of the week, which I'll be doing a little bit later on. Um, but but yeah, I mean. Uh, you know, obviously it was a fluid situation. You get information from the people you speak to on both sides of the fence. And, you know, I just see it because we've got a, a successful podcast, we, we put the, the information out there and we give our we give our opinion on that information that we get. And that's what you do when you do a podcast. But I think after today's conversations, I think we did get a little bit more clarity on it. And, and, I, and I think I've just seen the questions there from Mad Mark asking Ian. Well, I can answer, you know, because we're having a discussion off air. I, I think what... What the situation is is quite simple. We haven't really we haven't really moved forward and we haven't really gone back. We've actually stood still, but there's been a hell of a lot of noise this week. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And I think, you know, PCP have done a cracking job over the last few years to try and get this club, you know, out of the hands of Mike Ashley. Mike Ashley, at this moment in time, is still very willing to sell to the, you know, the the, the consortium, PCP, the Rubens and PIF. So we're in a situation now where all of this has exploded. We've had all of this noise. We've had Richard Masters, you know, come out mm -hmm. and, um, you know, be very, you know, patronising towards Newcastle fans. Uh, Mike Ashley's responded by saying that the Premier League has rejected it, which, of course, we now know they haven't rejected it because, of course, as we all know, which was well reported, PIF literally withdrew and walked away from the table. Um, the deal, though, was still very much on the table. Uh, they just walked away from the owners and directors uh, part of things. Now, the understanding we have is that more or less everyone has passed the owners and directors test, but there is something still outstanding with the Premier League. What that is, we don't know. There's some impasse which, you know, the, the consortium, Mike Ashley and the Premier League need to sort out. And until that gets sorted out, we can't get any further forward. So where do we stand now? Mike Ashley has obviously lost his rag. He's had a pop at the Premier League. He said it wasn't passed. Masters has fired back or the Premier League's fired back saying don't blame Masters. We're all in this together. We've actually all we've actually all we've actually all, you know, spoken with the, you know, the consortium. And Ashley, we're still willing to do business. I think where we're at is, you know, there's a decision to be made somewhere. Either Ashley takes legal action because they're preventing him from uh, by, you know, selling his football club or the, the consortium push on and, you know, go to arbitration. 
they go to arbitration, they'll, they'll, they'll probably likely feel as if they're going to get knocked back. Um, and if that happens, legal action will probably will happen again. How long will all that take? How long is a piece? How long is a piece of string? And that's going to be the issue that we've got. I think also um, we've seen. We've seen signings come in, and I think again it's been well well picked up by a few journalists that these aren't typical Ashley signings, and I think we all know these aren't typical Ashley signings. We've got a situation where we've seen players come in which were led to believe could have been on the potential new owners list. So if that's the case, then Mike Ashley has done something which he hasn't done for a long time, and is that and that is buy players that you couldn't sell on after the end of that contract. So I think is the takeover still on? I said it wasn't yesterday. Um I'm not going to sit on the fence. I think we've still got a willing seller. I know a lot of people disagree with that. I think we've still got willing buyers. I know some people will disagree with that. But I think the only time we will happily say, or unhappily say, I should say, that this takeover is dead in the water is when Amanda Stavely physically comes out with her husband or whoever else and says, this takeover is off. This takeover is over. That's it. We'll give it our best shot. This is the reason it didn't happen. We're sorry. We tried. We're best, and that's that, in my, you know, in my grand scheme of things, that's how I see it. That's my opinion, ju ju judging by the people I've spoken to. So, Mitch, I know you wanted to you wanted to jump in there. So, go on. I'll give it to you first, and then come to Steve. No, just my problem with the the Premier League statements. Um, you know, you're saying that they've, they've come out and said this and that, but in one of the statements, they say the decisions that have been taken. Well, mm -hmm. if if. If they haven't rejected it, then what decisions have been taken? What are they referring to? What are they hiding behind with that comment? Um, is this the impasse that we believe is in in play at the moment now? Um, and, and, it, and it is effectively a spiralling loop that we're going on and on and on again on the same kind of rattling the same, same cage. Um, it's super frustrating to read all of that because we, um, like you say, we've had a hell of a lot of noise and furore and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And to be fair, it seems like we're no further forward and no further backward in some respects. And it's that's ridiculous. For all of this, it's absolutely ridiculous. It is. It is. Steve, I mean, listening to what I've said there, do you think it's a good assessment? Do you think I'm right? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think it's? Do you think it's, I'm halfway halfway there? What, what's your views on that? I think you're right, Steve. But I, I think the I think the bit you missed, well, you didn't miss it. You, the bit that you that you sort of rolled over towards the end was that there's a bear trap there. I know you mm -hmm. said that somebody, you know, that there's there's still there's still outstanding issues somewhere along the line. I suspect that's a bear trap. I suspect it's been planted, and they're expecting PCP, PAIF, and the Rubens to walk into that um, and and get caught out for for whatever reason, um, or possibly it might be on the Mike Ashley side. I don't know, but there's certainly something hanging around that leaves that bad smell, which then leads to. The bear coming along, and he sticks his head in the honey pot, and boom, that caught. And that, that, I think, I think somewhere, someone along the line in the Premier League um, has decided that that is the way to go because of everything else has has sailed through as you're now suggesting from the information that you've gathered, Steve. That's all it can be. That's all it can be. Now you mentioned there about the signings. I think, I think uh, Liam Kennedy gave a very, very good assessment of those signings yesterday and who those signings were done by and why those signings were done. Um, for anyone who wasn't watching, Liam talked about, you know, the fact that we had players now that had basically broken the wage structure at Newcastle United and not just broken it, but completely smashed through it. Smashed it. You know, the likes of Fraser and Wilson now on over 100 grand a week, the likes of Hendricks coming along at 28, um, getting a four-year contract and on 70 grand a week. When Mo Diarmi, uh, last season was looking for a two-year contract and was thirty-year-old, um, and he was and there was he was knocked back, and he was on nowhere near the type of money that was being placed uh, on, on the head of of or on the, in the bank account of, of of Hendricks, and that that in itself says that things were moving, things were moving. Mike Ashley thought things were moving in in this football club in terms of a takeover because he has broken his own wage structure. And as I pointed out, that is why I think he threw his bottles out the pram. That's why he went screaming on, on 
was it Wednesday? Um, and 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 went absolutely berserk with the Premier League. Um, that's where it came from. Um, no question in my mind that he feels as though he's been sold a pup. He's been led down a path, and and it's the Premier League that's led him down, and the Premier League that's pushed him into a corner or pushed him into a position that he didn't want to be in. And that that position being spending money on Newcastle United and potentially being left with that burden. Mm, exactly, Steve Bruce. Of course, telling everybody that the uh, the takeover off. As I said, he's probably been speaking to a journalist who I know. And um, Bill Bush leaving the Premier League. That's a surprise as well. Um, 15 years and I mean, obviously that's an alleged uh, comment there from somebody saying that apparently he's the person leaking everything from the Premier League but um, yeah strange times certainly Ian um, you know it, it's it's good to see the players come in. I mean, you know, when you when you look at look at the squad, we were all complaining. I think the last time you were on that we needed the centre forward. Um, you know, we got Callum Wilson in. Great to see him come. You know, he is. You know, he's he's, he's had a few problems with injuries, but he's he's you know he's he's a proven Premier League striker. Got him in. You know, and we've also got somebody to fire the bullets. Um, somebody that Simon Jordan referred to on Talksport as a turd. I would say that uh, he doesn't realise that can sometimes be quite a, a pleasant tone up, up north. Uh, mm. And, of course, a defender, a left-back, um, a recognised left-back as well, it has to be said. So so three players you know, three players in the bag to back up what we brought in with, with Gillespie in goal, Hendricks in the midfield. And, of course, we had the news today in a socially distanced photo uh, with uh, Isaac Hayden and uh, Darlow, of course, you know, increasing their contracts as well. So Matty Longstaff, of course, signing, signing on the dotted line and promise of more to come. Um, it feels like Christmas, Ian. Well, I hope you're right, Steve. Um, or will it be Dave Besant, Andy Thorne, John Henry over oh, again? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I remember at you know, the start of that season being very, very optimistic. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid after 13 years under uh, Mr. Ashley's tenure, I, I've had all of the op- optimism battered out of us. Uh, you know, but, it, you know, on, look, it, 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 look, it looks much more positive than we've seen for a number of years, and you add that to the to the other more recent acquisitions, you know, the sort of some maximum, the you know, uh, Almiron, people like that. You know, it looks like we've got some creativity, some some pace. Um, I, I hope the defence is good enough, and I really do worry about the early part of the season without Martin Dubravka, because as we've discussed before, Dubravka last last year in the last season made more saves than any other goalkeeper and he needed to uh, that that's yeah. the thing you know that because the defense was a uh, suspect from from that perspective and i think in terms of not moving back or forward on the on the takeover steve i'm not surprised we're not moving back or forward on the takeover because you know the club has been has been completely tied up it cannot move back it cannot move forward. It's been wrapped up in completely newly manufactured red tape emanating from the Premier League's head office. You know, it's just awful. You know, and 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 I, you know, um, I, I'm I'm not averse to, to to writing letters to ministers, but I actually do think that the, the the ministers start need to start having a good look at the Premier League. The governance of the game, I'm afraid to say, is deeply flawed. It's not accountable. And, you know, it's just become a huge business with massive conflicts of interest. And, you know, they're just there for everybody to see. Cheese, cheese standing up did get buried buried a little bit. What was, your, what was your thoughts on how it went? I mean, what was the response to it? No, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that it's, uh, it, it, it is what it is, you know, like an, an end of the day adjournment debate. Uh, you know, it's, just, it's about raising an issue and, you know, hopefully getting some uh, response uh, fr- from a minister, but you know, end of day adjournment debates are just there to air an issue, not really to get anything done about it. You know, that's that, that, that's that's the way that those things. And sadly, I was pre-booked. I was already pre-booked to be in another meeting, so I couldn't be in the Commons to join uh, Chi. That's that's the way the daily works. I only found out that she was going to be on the day before. You know, so um, so that, that that's the way that 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 that, that, that pans out. And I was doing another meeting, so that's sad. From, from my perspective, I would like would like to be in there to give out some moral support, but unfortunately, wasn't able to do so. 
Got to say a credit to you and to Chi because you've both been fantastic through the whole, you know, the whole process. You know, whether whether it's right into the Premier League, Richard Masters, or you know, you know, trying to get things stirred up, and Ian Lavery as well. He's done his bit, so uh, certainly it's been great to see you know the local MPs doing doing their bit because it's uh, you know something which the voters have, have felt strongly about. Uh, Bizwidget says uh, it would be quite welcome if Amanda Stabley comes out and clarifies the current position and whether they are still in it. And clarify now that. It, that isn't going to happen, Bizwidget, because I think if they're still in it, then you know they're going to have to have, you know, NDA signed. It is still going to be very silent on 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 their behalf. I think the only time we will ever hear Amanda Stabley come out and say something publicly will be if it if it all collapses, mate. So, you know, that mm-hmm. is my opinion on that. Mitch, the signings, are you happy? Um, you know, are you pleased with the players that have come in so far? And are you must be pleased, I suppose, to hear that at least there is potential for more coming in over the next couple of weeks as well. Indeed so. Um, the one thing that was, was bothering me a lot was we had definite needs that needed to be fulfilled. And there hadn't been, and that these signings have addressed that. Um, so there's there's a fantastic start. I agree with everything that you guys have said about that. There is far from Ashley signings as you could possibly get some of them. Mm-hmm. So it did make you wonder, is he, spending, is he spending somebody else's money? Why is he going with those players? Why is he going with that plan? And actually has that contributed to his uh, rather frustrated outburst that he's done something that he wouldn't normally do on the back of being told something's uh, something's going to happen positively and then he's had the rug pulled from underneath him. Um, but if there's potential for more, that also makes you wonder, well, what's the motivation for that? Now he's had his little stamp with his feet and chucking the toys out the car. Um, but yeah, you kind of be disappointed with the signings. The, 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 the mm-hmm. certainly... Uh, address needs that would really were desperate for. Um, well, squad management's been appalling over the last couple of years and we now need to get people out. I know uh, Lejeune's gone on loan for a year, so that 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 needs to happen for him so he can get fit. Um, yes. when, when he came back, it was quite obvious that that second injury had taken its toll on him. Um, and the, prem- in the, in the, the spotlight of the Premier League is not a place to do that. So go back I'll, to Spain. Have yourself, have yourself a time to recuperate. I, I, I'll, I'll just I, you know I think there's nine players in uh, in who have got squad numbers under the uh, who, who was who are still at the end of that contract next year. Yeah. And that's not including uh, Dalo and uh, and uh, Hayden who've signed new contracts today apparently. So there's nine others who are like you know up for a free 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 transfer. Uh, in, in in 2021, and uh, you know, okay, some of them you're, you're not going to be massively worried about, but but others, you know, you can see that there's some there's some value there, um, in, in you know, it's it's a question of, you know, I think we're you know every, every so often though, you've got to have a, be thinking about, look, you've you've inherited these players, you know, they're in your squad, do you actually want these players to be part of your squad? You know, to, in order to move things forward, so you know that the, there's got to be some some comings and there's got to be some goings uh, as well. And I know that's being being managed, but well, I look at I look at the nine who 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 are, who are at the end of their contracts in 2021, and there's one or two of them there. I think well, like, you know, there's some value there possibly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the, the strange one today, Mitch, is is seeing Darlow and Hayden right. giving their contracts extended. Hayden, somebody, there's a few players in the team or squad, it has to be said, that split fans' opinion. It's what happens. It's the nature of the beast. Hayden's one of them. But Darlow, I think, um, you know, again, the, the, ex, the extension and, and such a long contract as well, very strange. Right. And very, again, very un ashley like isn't it? Um, mm. I'm glad it's. I'm glad it, they've done it because certainly for um, for Hayden, I think he did earn a new contract. I think uh, we all knew he had personal problems, and he had he started a couple of seasons ago getting sent off against Swansea and getting uh, sorry against Cardiff and getting pelters for it, um, and then stood up and come back and was actually quite a vital piece of the midfield jigsaw, um, and so. He's obviously overcome the personal issues that he had about possibly wanting to go back down south. Um, and so he's earned his new contract. That's great. Because he, he was one that we really did need to tie up. Darlow, um, well, let's see what he's made of. He's got his opportunity with Dubravka injured. I don't think he's as bad a keeper as some people would like to make him out to be. Um, and, and 
So, you know, he, he has an opportunity, and I think he's a very able deputy at Bravka. I think we've got to have a bit of faith in him. But again, five-year extension is an unusual one there as well. Mm. But that said, um, if he was to... Be, but because the other part of that is, is well, we've got Woodman on an extension and off, off at Swansea on loan for a season. What happens when he comes back to the club next year? Um, mm. And so, uh, again, there's, there's questions on the, the squad management, but at the same time, tying Darlow up with a five-year contract means one thing for sure. If he's to be moved out in the future, he's, he's retained some value in the transfer market. Um, yeah. So, in some respects, I can see why they've done that. Uh, Steve, before I come to you, I just want to ask Ian. There's people asking questions to, to Ian. Does Ian know about the top brass government apparently involved this week? And uh, uh, there was a question there about uh, Whitehall. There it is. Who's the Whitehall intermediary? Why is his input not being successful? Any, any? Can you do you know anything well, about that? It, it, I mean, obviously, uh, I think from from the government's perspective, the current government's perspective, you know, not let, let's not forget that at the start of this process. Uh, they, they had I- issued licenses to sell weapons again to the Saudi Arabian government, and you know, and, and having issued those licenses for those arms sales, I think this the current government are dead keen not to have anybody bad mouth in Saudi Arabia, and and so therefore it looks like that by their action, and um, that the Premier League are just bad mouth in Saudi Arabia. That that and and and, and so that's why I think there's Whitehall and governmental involvement in terms of trying to smooth things there because they don't want to see this criticism because I can tell you uh, the, 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 the weapon sales to Saudi Arabia are worth a damn sight more than the 360 million quid or whatever, 340 million, 240 million quid that they've got in for the Newcastle deal. Martin Colley's asking, can the government delay fans return until the Premier League have clarified their processes, including owners and directors test, and subject a DCMS review of their ability to govern football objectively? Is that, a, is that something that can happen? Well, I, I, I have to say, I, I think it'd be much more from the public health perspective, and unfortunately we see that all over the country things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, the, you know, the government themselves have said, that the R rate is now between 1 and 1.2. And there'll be places like Tyneside, sadly, where that R rate is probably greater than that, you know. Um, I, I mean, I, the the testing system, I'm afraid to say, is just nothing short of shambolic. You know, we've, I've had people, residents in Gateshead, who've been offered tests in Hoyk, Carlisle, Edinburgh. You know, it, it, it is just farcical. And, of course... You know, the, the the government are trying to defend the system and blaming people who don't need tests, apparently. Well, of course, people need tests because if, if they've been in touch with someone but are asymptomatic and need to get back to work, they need to find need to find it. Have they got it or have they not so they can get back to work? You know, and, and that's why people are going for tests. And so, therefore, from, 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 from that perspective, uh, you know, it, it, it is a real mess. And it's quite clear that there's just too much demand for tests that, that the government can't manage it. And they're trying to talk away around it by blaming the public. Uh, but um, but unfortunately, while the infection rate is going the way it is, you, you can't see your situation. I mean, the council don't ask their races yesterday. That was the local authority did that. Right. But I just can't see the government allowing um, a return to, to, to large sporting events, even with significant reductions in numbers for social distancing purposes. I mean, yeah. they've introduced the rule of six. So I'm going to have six people in the Gallagher end. It's, it's bloody ludicrous. I mean, I, you know, you can still go to the pub and sit with 100 people in a bar, socially right. distanced, but yet I can't go up the street to see my mother-in-law and have dinner with, like, you know, the, you know, the kids' grandparents and have, you know, the, the nieces and nephews round. It's, it's just ludicrous. I, I mean, yeah, where, I, don't know, I don't know where this is all going to go. I really, I really don't. Like, um, it's, it's crazy. Dunstan's game's off this weekend because the player tested positive. The rest of the team are all negative, but that's, you know, the game's off this weekend because of that. Uh, right. You know, bit of a bit of a nightmare situation we're in there. Uh, Ryan Sweeney yeah, says, from Steve, afar, do you think? It, yeah, go on, go on. Mitch, saying, just... from, 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 from afar, Ian was talking about the testing situation. And I, I look, look at what's going on back home and uh, with, you know, amazement. We've got here in the UAE, and we've had them since probably about one month into the, the whole COVID crisis, 11 driving test centres across the UAE. Um, 
then you just rock up. It's mm-hmm. not hard. You rock up yeah. with the Emirates ID, put that in. You don't even leave the car. The drive through, you know, mm-hmm. like everything else seems to be here. Um, but, you know, it, it, and it, it, and then I've been bouncing things around with, with Steve um, about Project Restart and, and, and uh, return to the fans, fans returning to grounds and seeing some of the things that haven't the fact they're in and it tallies with some of the stuff that, you know, connections at other clubs are, are talking to me about. Um, that you're going to have anywhere between five and thirty percent returns per stadium, depending on facilities and this, that, and the other. And it's it's you end up playing three D chess without knowing the rules, yeah. and it's going yeah. to be absolutely impossible for clubs to get it right. It's <clears> and all it'll take is for one club to get it wrong, and everybody's terrified of the situation that happened with the Atlanta Valencia game that apparently was but responsible for in excess of fifty thousand cases around yeah. Northern Italy, you know, and, and so I get it. I, I get why it's got to be done right. Um, but by God, it, it, it doesn't bode well for the future of, of, of a lot of football clubs at championship level and below. It, yeah. it, it's going to kill teams. Yeah, no, I, We saw Richard Masters today, didn't we? He was lobbying, lobbying the government and saying, you know, we've got to, we, we need answers. We need to get fans back into the ground. He talked about it yesterday mm. about seven hundred million that's going to be lost, and he's trying to lobby that. He's trying to lobby the government to, to to come out and and to allow this to happen, which was quite ironic. And he, you know, he's lobbying the government. I put it on Twitter. He's lobbying the government at the same time as all the lobbying that we've done to try and get him to speed up this owners and directors test. He's completely ignored. Yeah. One little factor, Ian, that, that another factor in all of this that, that I'd like to ask your opinion on, um, somebody asked there about, about who it was in Whitehall that's perhaps uh, doing the pushing, you know, which government minister or which former government minister do you think it is? Now, one of the things is that in all negotiations, especially when you come in as an arbiter, as someone as a middleman, and, and he's trying to sort of carve the way, carve his way through um, all the little idiosyncrasies and and trying to smooth the waters on everybody's behalf, is that you need a bit of trust, and you need to be trusted by all sides. Now, I think the problem that our government has at the moment is that they've sent they possibly sent someone in on their behalf to say, look. Smooth the waters. Tell let let's for example, I, I'll use this as an example. Tell the Kuwaitis it's all right. We'll cover their backs. You know, if it's BN Sports, we'll cover your backs, guys. We'll we've got an eye on this. We'll keep an we'll keep a watch on Saudi Arabia. We'll make sure that this doesn't happen. And then at this, on the very same day that that the government you know, when when this is, you know, say Tuesday, when we're expecting this to happen or, you know, people were, were, were making assumptions that this might be coming out this week. Um, we had the government who's come out and said, you know what, we can ignore international law if we want. We don't need to bother about international law. We can throw we, we can make our own rules up. So in one respect, you've got them lobbying, lobbying a country or lobbying organisations saying, trust us, trust us. And at the same time, the national government is saying, you don't need to trust us on that. Yet we can create that. We can create our own rules. So that's the two fierceness of 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 where we are at the top of of the of the country in terms of who's running the country, and yet we're expecting people to just say trust us on this. You know, leave it. We'll we'll sort it out on that. And now we're in exactly the same situation with COVID, aren't we? You know, trust. We're trusting the people, but at the same time. We're being told that there's X, Y, and Z problems, but they don't actually tell us what those X, Y, and Z problems are or what they're going to do to, to roll over them and, and to stop those problems occurring anymore. It's, it's, I mean, I know as a politician, you get that you get this in the neck from, from all quarters, I'm sure, but it, you do lose your trust, don't you, in those people, in, especially people in that particular party. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the thing is, Steve, it's not just trust, but it's also trust in competence as well. And, and, and I think that, that, that they are actually suffering a competence bypass at the, at the moment on so many different fronts. And, and I'm and I'm being overtly party political. I've been around in watching and being involved in, you know, politics in Parliament for the last 10 years and in local government for 27 years before that. And I have to say, by the way, I don't think I've ever seen, you know, ministers, the civil servants, 
who are so grossly incompetent as this bunch are. And that's not just in health or education, it's in transport, it's in local government, it's in treasury, you know, you name it, they have a real competence problem. And, you know, that undermines trust more than anything else, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the actions this week that you're right about the, the, the new the, the new bill that they're going to put through, which is going to, uh, um, uh, going to uh, ignore uh, previously uh, agreed international treaties is just uh, like unprecedented, unprecedented. And it's I, I'm afraid that Dominic that Cummings is a great fan it. of chaos theory, you know. Yeah, it's the signal that it sends out there. So that, that's why I'm relating it to football. I'm relating it to say, you know, the people that you're, that you're trying to convince that, that, that we can, we, we as a government can can act as your eyes and ears on this. You know, we, we'll make sure that the Premier League do X, Y and Z and they'll cover your back and they'll make sure that things don't happen. And yes, they're just words. But with those words come credibility. And when that credibility is being pulled and that rug's being pulled under your feet from or under the feet of the person who's trying to sell that to them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I know we use the phrase sand Arabs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, as, as sort of, you know, throwaway remarks. But what they're doing is they're pouring, they're pouring petrol over the top of it, aren't they? You know, they're, they're, they're giving, the, giving whoever that negotiator is absolutely no chance of winning the day when it comes to face-to-face -face explanations and and looking for that credibility and looking for that that confidence that yes we we are yes i believe you you are covering for me and in the football mm -hmm. sense that's what they've done that's what they've done maybe that is maybe maybe they got so far down the line this week and then something like that happened where you know they thought it was going to go and then somebody's went whoa hang on a minute you know we don't know we don't know but it could be something as simple as that you know, it could be something way outside of the remit of the game. And that's why Mike Ashley's getting angry, because it's nothing that he could have done, nothing that PCP, nothing that PIF could have done. But somebody somewhere has said or done something that's upset the apple cart, if you like, and everything's been thrown out of that apple cart, and we're now trying to pick them all up. You know, that's the – that. I mean, that, that's a, a very much a possibility. Mm. Mm. It's, a, it's a nice little book, that, by the way, by George Bernard Shaw, The Apple Cart, by the way. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, uh, John Brown asks, uh, do you think that the BN Sport has apparently had an influence in the Premier League's decision or they nailed on for renewal of their contracts went up? I mean, BN Sport has had its part to play. I think we all accept now the Pirates... Never, no, no, how, how dare you? That's dreadful. How dare BN you? <laughs> yeah, sports definitely played their part in this, didn't they, really? And, and the Qataris. Yeah. It's it's as simple as that. I mean, a lot of people are saying, I don't understand why it's happening. It's Qatar, isn't it? And it's Saudi. It's 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 a, it's a political it's a political battle, isn't it? Yeah, but it yeah. wasn't you, you've also got to remember it wasn't just being sports. There was other broadcast partners who rallied around by them to to press the Premier League about the piracy issue very hard. Um, which I still find ironic as you know, still get a chipped Amazon Fire Stick and stick Cody on it and watch whatever you like, but still give games to Amazon. But there you go, that's another matter. Um, so yes, the half had an influence, and I don't care what anybody else says, and the Premier League would try to deny it, and I'm sorry, no. They're keeping one of their broadcast partners suite. However, being sports are hemorrhaging money at the moment. Um, I would be amazed if they can offer the same amount for the MENA region, if it's kept as it is, yeah. Um, for the next round of, of bids, that they're, they're, they're shedding jobs, um, and they're losing the monopoly in the Middle East. They, they, they lost the F1 last year. I think they're, they're losing the MotoGP next year, and so, so some of this has been slowly eroded and slowly chipped away. Um, I think they've, they've, there's been another round of redundancies of being sports. Um, so, Richard, you know, please, it, it, please. <laughs> <laughs> so you know the, the, the word word in the region is they're not in the strongest position financially at the moment and why they're making the cuts they are is to prepare themselves for the next round of bids for the Premier League um, rights my gut is on the back of this I suspect the Premier League may rip the MENA region apart and some of the other regions apart We've seen at our football conferences, the Asian football conferences we discussed about I think about a month ago. Um, now, now does country by country. 
and and it get because they knew they would have to deal with stuff like this because it's across the entire uh, not just the entire Gulf, the entire part of Asia, where this country doesn't like that country and they won't receive television feed from that country and this country. And then you get into Africa and there's issues with some of the African countries and issues within some of the African countries. And so um, it, it very much depends on how the Premier League manage the next round of rights bidding. And I suspect it will be very different. I suspect this will be the catalyst for that as well. Um, and there's no way B and are going to be as strong as people think they are. Um, the next sort of year for them, I think that the right next rate for bidding in 2022. Um, but it wasn't just B in that were keeping sweet as well. There were other broadcast partners dragged into this and made protests about this. There's, there's no doubt about that. Mm. I think I think the key to that, Neil, as well, is that. That's why Masters is shouting and screaming and lobbying for fans to be allowed back in because the product that he's serving up to the likes of Qatar, um, to BN Sports, to his other partners is shocking because without the fans, mm. the football is nothing. It's not the, the same. Is right. nothing. You can put as much pipe music and as piped crowd and singing and, and cheering as you like, but Without the fans, the game is nothing. And that's why Masters wants it, because he knows that he's going to have to have, and, and there's going to be a, another massive hit, because countries have obviously already lost China. Um, they'd already lost Chinese games before they, they eventually lost their Chinese partner. And there was a lot of conversation about how, um, without the fans in the ground, the, the, the whole... I mean, let's face it, the last nine games were shocking. They were shocking for us because we didn't get the results that we that we wanted, you know, or that we expected. The performances were poor. And when you look at what, you know, we're back in tomorrow, um, if Newcastle United play with the pace um <laughs> that they that they put in um during the during the restart that we had and we go in with the same attitude, then we've got really, really serious problems. But it wasn't just us that played poor football during those nine nine games. Virtually every game that you watched on TV was mm. absolutely shocking, you know? And that showed you how important the fans were to give those players that extra 5%. And Masters is selling BN Sports a pup if he cannot have the fans in the ground. And that's his big major concern, I think. Steve, is piracy think... the stum... sorry, Ian, is piracy the stumbling block, Steve? Like Raymond's asking, do you think piracy's been the stumbling block, or do you think it's more to do with the, you know, the, the battle between the Qataris and the Saudis, and you know, the, the... it's all it's all combined, isn't it? And this yeah, is I why mean... they keep putting obstacles in the way of PCP. Yeah, I don't think it is the piracy, though, Steve, because we've had we've had many many uh, messages that have come through and reports that have been, you know, shown in the media where. The, the Saudi Arabian government has taken the, the whole piracy aspect um, and, and shaken it and got rid of it and put legislation and laws in that, that uh, eliminate piracy now. Um, you know, they've taken it seriously. They've had to take it seriously. The WTO report made them take it seriously. And I think that, if anything, it's, it's a historic in terms of compensation for what Qatar felt as though they'd lost could have been an issue. In, if you wanted to rule that within piracy, um, and I think that that it, but again, money money coming in, especially when you've got, as Neil says, you've got situations where you know that the BN Sports are, are struggling uh, financially, or have made made uh, haven't made as much money, or have lost various various uh, contracts here, there, and everywhere. So finance is the is the key you know you give the, you give people enough money in compensation then they'll go and they'll go away so i don't think piracy is the thing i think there's something else there's something else there within this within the whole of this negotiation that is that is clouded and and is now a, a, an obstacle that we need to get through and and to get past Steve. that's my opinion that's my personal opinion go I on think, i think on the earlier point as well and i just think it's hugely ironic that you know, Richard Masters wants to get fans back into ground, and yet you know he won't even answer cor a correspondence from fans' representative groups. I just think it's just, you know, you know, he, he sees the value in fans on one side, but it's a cash value. It's not about you know what they bring 
to the game. It's he's he's more interested in the Absolutely. 700 million pounds generated by fans paying for tickets at the gate. The atmosphere, I you know he, he, he knows it's important. He does know it's important because that's what sells it abroad, you know. Yeah. But but I mean, you, you know, by not responding to fans' representative groups, I just think it's utterly disgraceful, frankly. Like you know. And he's also he's also doing it at a time where one of his nineteen members or one of his twenty members has spent over two hundred million on players this season. You know, right. in Chelsea. So you're sitting there going, "We're going to lose seven hundred million." You go, "Hang on, one of you's just spent two hundred million for goodness' sake." You know, right. you know who are, we've got people who are who are, are struggling and are going to struggle for the next six months to a year in this country um, financially. And he's and he's beyond about, and beyond. And beyond, quite possibly. Yeah. And he's winning oh, yeah. about 700 million. We've got clubs going out of existence and potentially going out of existence lower down the leagues. We've got we've got Durham FA who's announced that there'll be no more games. Clubs can train and 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 have practice matches among themselves, but they cut there's no games in the Durham FA this weekend and possibly for the foreseeable future. You know, and, and how are those clubs going to exist? You know. We've got Wigan who have gone, who have virtually almost gone out of existence. We've got Berry that have gone out of existence, mm. and they are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, quite frankly, well, I mean, the, I mean, I think the AFL in the last financial year, full financial year, had collective debts seventy-two clubs of over one point two billion quid, and they had you to know, take, and they had to be given a two hundred million pound loan. Or that negotiating a two hundred million pound loan from the Premier League, from mm -hmm. the from from the, what they think will be their 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 forthcoming TV that deals that they can negotiate themselves, putting that up as collateral in the hope that the clubs will all dip in, or that the Premier League will, will go to its go to its its financiers and say we need to help them, but we've got a bit of collateral behind them. We've got seventy two clubs here. What what's that? Right. Seventy two grounds that they can sell off? I don't know. But goodness mm. sake, you know, it's it's an absolute mess. Aye. Yeah, Aye. David Anderson saying, is it not the fact that MBS is named as chairman of PIF? I, I just generally don't think that's the case. I think um, I, I don't think there's been an issue with the owners and directors test. I just think the Premier League keep asking them to do something else. And um, I think we all know that uh, there was an executive sent over from Saudi, um, you know, basically handed the Premier League what they wanted to, you know, maybe it was a letter to say that PIF, um, you know, PIF were obviously, uh, you know, going to be part of this takeover, but that the Saudi state weren't. Maybe the Premier League have demanded that the Saudi state are on the forms. We just don't know. Uh, that is the that is the million-dollar question. That is the one thing that we don't know, uh, what is holding up this takeover. But, um, you know, rest assured, I think that, um, you know, Amanda Stabley and PCP, who we we'll have to remember played a part in facilitating the deal of Man City, have got experience at doing these kind of things. And I'm sure they're not going to put £70 million pound of their own money up without doing their due diligence and homework as to as to what's going to happen. They'll have even looked at the Premier League owners and directness test and thought that they wouldn't have had an issue. So, um, you know, something somewhere is holding this up and uh, only the owners and the buyers uh, understand what the Premier League are playing at. It's up to them to find resolve to it and uh, hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later. The good news is money's in, uh, you know, players are bought, promising more players on the way. Uh, I think really the key now is A, Mike Ashley does do what he says he's going to do, which is look at all the alternatives to fight, uh, you know, fight the Premier League and, and get this takeover through. And also make sure that we stay in the Premier League, Mitch. We've got to, that's yeah. the key now, isn't it? Uh, you know, let's not forget, you know, we'll, we'll start kicking a football round in 25 hours time, um, you know, at West Ham. And that's got to be the focus, staying in the Premier League. Well, mm. in in part, that may have been some of the additional motivation to bring some of the players in he's brought in. Um, he, he's he's put been through two preventable relegations that he's had to then dip into his own pocket to get with back up again, and he got lucky. He, he found people that could get with back up again first time, so it's cost him an extra hundred million pound. Um. Perhaps the pennies finally dropped with them that if you spend a little bit of that 100 million or 50 million um, and try not to get relegated in the first blinking place, that's the best way to preserve the cash value of the club, which I'm presuming he still wants 300 million for. 
I would be curious to know what his reaction would be if somebody was to turn up and not offer him 250 now. Would he still take it? Would he still, you know, would, would he view that somebody slapping 250 million down and that was a guaranteed and it was full and final and they could sail through the UND tests? Um, that, you know, would he, would he be at the point where he had cut me losses and do it? Would he, would he want to take that? Or is he just going to be hard nosed and say, no, I want me 300 million? And that's why I bought these players to preserve your Premier League status, to preserve the value of my club. Yeah. I, I, the, the, one, the one question I, I've got is, 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 does anybody think there's any malign influence being exerted by other clubs in the Premier League? Mm. Well, Ian, he, 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 Ian, somebody told me, who I trust exceptionally, um, who is in the world of the football finance, that there were six clubs preparing to make some sort of comment or statement to the league once the new Saudi were involved in the takeover in the Castle United. Mm -hmm. And some of them aren't, aren't clubs that have been named. But they right. were all clubs who potentially had something to lose, like us suddenly being projected to a different level financially. Um, whether that's malign influences or not, I don't know. But certainly, some were very ready to apply what pressure they could. Um, and I have to say, it'd be very interesting to see what the clubs and where the clubs stand now. Now one of their member clubs has openly come out and criticised the Premier League. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which see, side they, they, of that line are you going to lie now? And are you then going to turn around and have a go at Newcastle on the back of that? It's difficult to know. I, I think I think it's there's an interesting dynamic here, in as much that you know there are some very profitable clubs and wealthy clubs in the Premier League, and there are others who are chugging along and you know doing doing okay. But the thing is, how many of those owners of the chugging along clubs at some stage have considered selling their club? And automatically now, selling a club looks much more difficult with, with this hanging over the Premier mm -hmm. League because, because if another club tries to go through a takeover process and there isn't the same rigour applied to the owners and directors test, uh, the, 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 the perspective of a legal challenge by Newcastle United and, uh, and PCP becomes even greater at the moment. So you know, I, I, I'll, I'll I'll bet there's some really quite worried owners out there who aren't in that bracket of the comfortable clubs, shall we say? Yeah, and we've also had statement from from the Premier League that they are going to review the owners and directors tests. Now yes. a review mm -hmm. will tell you that it's going to be strengthened, not weakened. No, not well we've been arguing for that. Work. So that so again, you know the, the, that that. That, that tells you that, that, that it's going to be a stronger owners and directors test, which is going to make it more difficult. And if some of those people, as you are, some of those owners, as you say, uh, Ian, are, are looking at similar type of deals to the one Newcastle United are, are, are getting or similar type of buyers, mm -hmm. um, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, you know, what if the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund suddenly steps in, for example, and decides to take it? Because they're similarly, similarly very, very wealthy, um, would they have the same problem? Would would the same problems ensue? Would it be dragged in, um, or are we, or are we, or are we going to tighten it up to the point where we make it easier for charlatans to come in? You know, um, the, the well, Wigan. I mean, look at Wigan. You know, we, yeah, we, we're going to say, I mean, you see, if, if anything told you that the owners and directors test needed to be stiffened up, and I know it's the Premier League, not the English Football League, but look what happened at Wigan and how flimsy the owners and directors test was in that context in terms of what happened to that club. And basically, the club was bought to use as a tax write-off by the look of it. Yeah, and also, yeah. Ian, you look at the number of clubs that once they're relegated, suddenly come up for sale. So suddenly... As soon as the the, the sort of the, the golden goose, the egg smashed, they've got, they've been relegated from the Premier League. The parachute payments disappear, and you see when we've got it down the road, you know it's sitting there down the road at Sunderland. It's only fifteen or sixteen miles away, and they're now languishing in the in the third tier of football because mm. 
their, their owner eventually, after all the money he put in, had, uh, had to bail out. And mm -hmm. now, the, the, you know, the, what's the chances of them resurrecting themselves in the manner that they did? Wigan, it's not long since they were in the Premier League, know. you know? Um, yeah. Not long since they won the FA Cup. They certainly won it, <laughs> you know? You know, yeah. we had the success that Wigan had had with the FA yeah. Cup, for goodness sake, you know? But, yeah. Uh, everybody's won stuff since we did, man. <laughs> 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 Lads, what do, we, what do we make about Bush? I mean, like, a lot of people asking this question, question um about bush stepping down is it is it significant do you think uh ian do you think you know bush bush is uh obviously rich as his right hand man he's been trimmed so masters is that he's bush trimmed um he's yeah. gone what what, uh, what's the, what what do you think ian is it is it uh, significant I, I, I i'm think i'm thinking it would have bird in a hand me like but i'm not i'm not, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not really sure. I, I, I don't know what's going on there. But you see, the thing is, you know, like you were saying before, Steve, you know, about you know, the the, the buyers, the sellers might have an idea what's going on. You know, there's I think they're all scratching their heads. They don't know really what is fundamentally motivating the Premier League to be taking the attitude that it is. And if they do know, well, please sort it out as quickly as you possibly can, so, so that there's no excuses. But, but, you know, I, I, I do hope that Mike Ashley does one last thing which is of benefit to Newcastle United before he departs, and that is fights this as much as he possibly can so that he, as an individual, is allowed to sell an asset. You know, it's restraint to trade from his perspective, really. You know, he's not yes. allowed to sell his own asset. Simon Jordan's brought that up a few times on Talk Sport, and uh, I've got to agree with him. It is, it, it is, Mitch, isn't it? Really, a, an issue which Mike Ashley, you know, has to tackle probably on his own because if he wants to sell the club, which we, we believe yeah. he does, then it's him who's got to take the the Premier League to task over this. Well, yeah, that's the, the nature of the beast with it. Now is the only person who has legal recourse is Mike Ashley. Uh, this is why we've been saying for weeks that we were advised that he was. I had a team briefed and just about ready to go just in case and that seems to be um, happening on the, as a result of the rather nuclear statement through the week. Um, it is restraint of trade. There's no, no doubt about that. That's why if he was to go at it and be successful, it's the kind of ruling that would blow football open like Bosman did. Yeah. I, don't, I think, think people don't realise the significance of that. And I would be interested to know what if they just went ahead and bought it mm -hmm. and did the sale? Yeah. And, and said the Premier League, it come on then. Earlier, actually, wasn't it? Come on know? then. Yeah. You know, right. say to them, well, come on then, what are you going to do? Because right. Right. It, it, right. it's a strange state, it's state of play. Um, and, and you get the frustration. I mean, oh, I, I also, my mate John Melrose said about how about relegation and taking the chance on the English Football League. Uh, uh, owners and directors tests. Well, they would allow Coco the clown to own a club. So, you know, yeah, it would probably go through. But that's why I also believe that QSI were talking to Leeds when they were in the championship and why it's now off since they've been promoted. Mm -hmm. Because they know it's a harder test. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, my, my feeling would be is, is, is if Ashley's really that determined to sell it, now we'll see what's going to happen. As Martin says, yeah, it could be they could, they could let it happen and then give a forty point deduction or something stupid like that to guarantee relegation. Um, be an interesting state to play if they did. Um, whether um, Bush's movement has anything to do with everything, it's probably not. Um, we've got very good at looking for conspiracy theories. And so we're all primed to read sometimes too much into certain things, I think. Um, and we'll never know anyway. Aye. No. Aye. Yeah, well. it's interesting. It's interesting. It's an interesting, you know, interesting time. Um, just trying to check out online actually the the Bill Bush story, and um, he is he is. 
basically set to leave after 15 years. It says here, I'm just reading on the Mail Online, um, you know, he's, he essentially he was a, playing a key role in the failed Saudi Newcastle takeover. So it is very interesting that it's a story which the Athletic are running. The Daily Mail has now picked up on it. So um, it will be interesting to see whether that's played its part because there's a lot of people, Steve, believe that, you know, there's a few... Uh, you know, there's a few skeletons buried in the in the Premier League's closet over this, and and Ian's pointed out that things may not quite have been, you know, as the same. There's uh, the football needs to be the football needs to be the football authorities need to be addressed. I think you know maybe hold into the hold into this century. Maybe I, I think that's probably the best way to describe it, uh, without without accusing anybody of anything. But it maybe it's maybe it's a significant move that Bush is stepping down. Yeah, it, it, well, it, it could well be because obviously he's, he's, like you say, he's been there 15 years. I think the key to it is a very strange timing. You know, one day before or 20, less than 24 hours before the season starts, they suddenly decide that he's going to move on. Now, if he does, if he is moving to an advisory role, that's very similar to what Scudamore did. You know, Scudamore then took an advisory role for a period of time before he then got. Uh, before he then finally retired. I mean, be interesting if he's been there 15 years, are we going to suddenly see uh, that the clubs are all going to be asked for another £250,000 each for to give him a nice little nest egg of a, of a, of a, of a handover? You know, is that is that what's going to come on? Um, it's quite ironic, isn't it, that the clubs wanted to have control. They've got that 20, you know, the, the 20 of them sitting there. We're now looking and we're saying, you know what? Those football clubs, the, 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 those teams that, that, that run the Premier League, need to be dragged into the 21st century. It's not that long ago that we were saying that the FA and the Football League 92 needed to be dragged into the 20th century because, mm -hmm. you know, they were all run by, you know, butchers, corner shop merchants, the power of the, of if you remember, the North West, you know, the clubs that, that basically set up um, the working men's game. Um, no, I... in, in in football, you know that the twelve original members of the football league, um, and and his, that carried on all the way through. We saw it right up until eighty nine, when Sir John Hall managed to wrestle uh, with the help of John Woff the shares from from invisible people, families that didn't even know they held them, you know, um, and 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 ousted somebody whose family had 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 shares and allowed him to become the chairman of Newcastle United when he had absolutely no money or certainly mm -hmm. not anywhere near the wealth that was needed to even repair the toilets in the Gallagher end for goodness sake you know i remember i remember being on the Gallagher end in the in the 70s and you used to go in and you used to wonder what changes had been made to the ground at the start of the next season. And I remember there was an absolute Ferrari of laughter because they'd painted orange lines and crosses down and put a fence in down the middle of the of the centre of the of the ground in front of the scoreboard, if you remember. We didn't used to have that barrier there, but that was to allow the police to get up through the middle. And there was that little gate at the side where the coppers used to stand on both sides. And we just laughed our heads up and said, that's where the money's gone this time. It's gone on mm. some orange paint to paint some stripes and some crosses, you know. It, it, that's what it was like at Newcastle United. But we, we actually worked out that the toilets in the Gallagher end I think it was going to be something like 2022 if the ground had stayed the same, that eventually it would have been impossible to get into those toilets because the amount of bitumen that was put on the walls every season <laughs> that narrowed and narrowed and narrowed the Gallagher end, the Gallagher end <laughs> toilet would now be that wide. It would be impossible to use. You know, that's where the money went. That's that's all they spent on it, didn't they, you know? And how <laughs> ironic that we're now saying we need to drag billionaire owners into the 21st century to sort out the game. It's, it's unbelievable. But there, would, there would still be copies of the football pink on the wall underneath all that picture in the main studio, you know, from, from, oh, from 1948 or something, you know. Exactly. Yeah, remember all that litter on the other side, you know, the, the broken glass uh, and the litter that just congregated in among those bushes, you know. But let's not forget, you know, it was, it was Stan Seymour, right, who, who, who at the time, when, when and, you know, before it was before the, the John Hall take over, took, took take over, you know, Westwood and all them, they wouldn't stump up 10 grand each because okay. Newcastle were in financial bother. And all of those directors, the Fenton Braithwaite's and all, you know, all those names, you know, and McKeague and all them. Yeah. And Stan Seymour asked them all for 10 grand to sustain the club through the next season, 10 grand each. It was, you know, and 
half of them walked away, including the president of the Football League. Yes, Lord Westwood. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? You know, I, know. I mean, when, when you look back and you, you and you see what now, this is a football club that that whose ground wasn't good enough to to actually play any of the nineteen sixty six World Cup. Uh, Games in, you know, the games were played in Burren or played at Roker Park, but Newcastle United and and how many how many plans did we see from that period onwards about potential redevelopment at St James's Park, and eventually right. they spent the first cup money. Some of it went on Jinky Gym, and the rest of it went on the East Stand, which we still have. Which right. we still right. have. You know? right. that was but, you remember, remember the Tom Dinnery plan to, to build a ground at Liamsley? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, there was there was a there was there was that one. There was a, there was a there was some amazing plans, and you look back. Gosforth Park. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. oh, hate my honestly. We we were going to have grounds all over the place. Honestly, Gated, Gated Stadium as well was another one, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, you see, there's a story behind that, Stevie. You see. Come on, then let's have the well, story. Well, you see, John Hall was in cahoots with Jory Gill, who was the leader of the council, and basically John Hall used Gated. And Jordy Gill, to be fair, as leverage to allow to get Newcastle City Council to let planning go ahead for the redevelopment of St James's Park because they were just like sticking their heels in the ground. And so John Hall and Jordy worked together on a basically, I think it was a phantom plan to uh, to, to relocate St James's next to Gateshead Stadium. And as soon as that started being talked about seriously. Newcastle City Council relented and started allowing the plans to go ahead for the redevelopment of St James's Park. So it was initially initially thirty six thousand with the corners and the and, and the two stands at each end. You know, um, so that, that's what happened, really, Steve. Yeah. And, and of course, for John at the time, very very popular in Gateshead because of the building of the Metro Centre. So he, he had course. he had the ear of 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 Gateshead Council, didn't he? And that's he did, what I. that's what scared the living daylights out of Newcastle City Council. And and it, and it was really that it was just using Gateshead as leverage, and then yeah. that allowed the redevelopment of the ground because they had they had resisted it for years and years and years, much to the frustration of. Of, of, of the club, you know. Yep. Let's start talking a little bit about the football. We've got uh, just under an hour left in the show. Uh, Anton Mackay's asking a question. Uh, who out of the new signings would we start tomorrow? He only feels that uh, Lewis might start. Mitch, we'll come to you first, mate. Um, you know, it's, it's a big decision for Steve Bruce, and it's a decision he probably didn't expect to have with, you know, a bit of choice. Um, you know, who, who would you who would you like to see him, him start tomorrow, and who do you think he'll start? I, I don't see why he couldn't start all of them except Fraser. I think Fraser's short of uh, training time with him not having played duties, contract running out, and all the COVID situation. Um, but all the, there's no, I don't think there's any reason why the rest couldn't play um, and get involved. Um, it already seems like you know that that little video that uh, um, uh, Andy Carroll had flicking around with. The two new signings and Richie um, would suggest there's no problem with uh, them integrating with the squad. Um, so why not chuck them in? Um, you seem determined to get Hendrick, who's obviously somebody he, he likes the cut of his jib. So if he's fit enough, and, and again, he's another one who's probably short of training time, but it, he seems to be further on. He's played for Ireland. So, you know, um, I don't see why we couldn't chuck all of them in except for his, I really. Mm. Up front, Tom Dixon reckons we should start Carl, uh, Carol and Callum Wilson. Uh, Mitch, is that is that your choice up front? I've got a horrible feeling he's going to start Joe Linton. <laughs> well, yeah, well, back back on the contract uh, conspiracy theory, aren't we? Uh, does he have that clause in his contract? That means he's got really to play mind, every blinking game. Was I, scratch, was I scratching my nose when I said what, that? It's that's that great, phrase, yeah. William. That phrase, isn't it, Mitch? That phrase that Steve comes out, horrible feeling. And Joe Linton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, no, we play him in like a number ten, you see. So I mean, that'll, that's where he's meant to play, isn't he? You know, they, I mean, I, I, I still remember, you know, poor John Dahl Thomason. I thought he got crucified at our club, and he went not to be a European superstar because he was forced into doing a job that he was never meant to do because, to do, because no. Shira, got in, Shira got injured, you know. 
All right, yes, James yes. has given us his team, Mitch. Good. See, see how this compares to yours. Darlow, Manquillo, Lascelles, uh, Fe, 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 no, Fernandez, 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 Fernandez yeah. Fernandez, right. Lewis, Hayden, Shelby, Shelby. Figgy, ASM and Richie. Yeah, Shelby gets in a lot of people's teams. You'd be surprised, Ian. So that, <laughs> we'll, leave that, we'll, leave, we'll leave that team on there. How, where's, where's, where's Wilson then? Is, 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 he's only got 10 there, James. How are you? He's only got 10, aye. Two, three, four, five, yeah. six, seven, eight, nine. Ah, you're right, he has. He's only got 10. So he's playing with 10, which gives West Ham a chance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Rich, Richie's injured, somebody's saying. Go on, uh, look, use that as a bit of a basis. Obviously, you want to play 11, Mitch. But go on, Darlow. Mm. Would you play Darlow in goal? Is he in your team? I think he's he's the best got to be keep as we've got. Yeah, he's got to okay, be. In there. Last, yes, from all of you on Darlo, I'd say Darlo as well, a hundred percent. Um, I, I'll I would say Manquillo is a good shout because at the yep. moment he's he's probably what best in that position. What about yep. you, Ian? You're looking a bit pensive. No, no, no. I'm 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 just I'm just looking at Shelby and and I, I, I don't think Mitch will be playing. You no, know. I think he's, somebody's saying no. he's injured. Manquillo's in then, I think, from us. Lascelles, he's fit, I think. So, mm. Lascelles is going to start, isn't he? He's club captain. Well, but, he's captain. Mm. You wouldn't put Henry in? I think, is I he think, not fit? I think, Hendricks, I think Hendricks should be fit. But I think, look yeah, at the back four. Lascelles, Lascelles, Lascelles and Fernandez. is that is that your is that your centre-halves? Would yes. you go for that, lads? Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. Lewis at left back. Yeah, that's so. Yeah. That's so. We're going for at the back. Hayden in mm -hmm. midfield. Everybody happy with Hayden or not? Yeah, cool. Yeah, midfield. yeah. No problem with that. <clears throat> right. Okay. So, Ian, you don't want Shelby in there. You prefer Hendricks, would you say? Are they too similar, Hayden and Hendricks? No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll have Hayden in. You'd have Hayden in. And what I... about and what about Shelby? You don't want Shelby in. I, I'm, 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 I think, I think what you'll get is. Uh, West Ham will try to play at home a high tempo game, which will just run past them. He had a blinder. He had an absolute blinder down there last year, so that that could be potentially why James has put him in. Um, right. What about you, lads? Steve, Mitch, I'd, would you play, have... I'd play Hayden, Shelby, and and possibly Hendricks in midfield with with Miggy, uh, Maxi, and uh, Wilson up front. There's I'd Josh's play, Josh's play, team play, 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 play in the middle, and then those two playing tight. Shelby just in front of them, Hendrick and and, and uh, Hayden pinning it, and then yeah. those, then the two wide men and Wilson up front on his own. That's what I would play. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's James's team, but with that's what James meant to put. He says, but that's yeah. what Josh has put. So that's that. I would say that's not a bad team to start tomorrow. Like I would say, I would say that's probably about right. Apart from the obvious for me, I wouldn't have Joe Linton in there. I'd have anybody in there but Joe Linton, uh, as, as people know. Um, but I can understand why he's in, and I do believe that'll be. I think that could be the team, lads. I think that. I, I think that's right. fairly fairly spot on. I couldn't see past it. Unless they decide to go with Hendricks, um, and unless unless he decides to play Andy Carroll, who's been in form in the friendlies instead of Joe Linton, which you know play play Andy Carroll when he's fit. My my you know my feeling on the matter, because you can't get that. The one thing that Andy Carroll brings when he's on the bench at home is he gets the crowd up for it. If the game's been horrendous, do you know what I mean? He gets the crowd up. People think there's going to be a, you know, there's going to be some kind of input from him. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what, what comes of that. Let's look, look, look more towards the season then, lads. I mean, obviously now that we've made these signings, are you feeling a bit more optimistic, Steve? Are you, do you feel a bit more optimistic about it? I mean, we were all doom, doom and gloom when we were talking about this last week, but is there is there a sense of optimism? I mean, uh, Ian's already mentioned that dreaded season, which I brought up um, with Gibbo and Supermac earlier this week, the 88-89 the season where we, we made all these fantastic signings and then ended up getting relegated. But I, I've got a feeling we'll, I've got a feeling we'll be all right. I think I've, I've definitely changed my attitude anyway. Yeah. I, I don't think we'll go down. Yeah, I've changed my attitude as well because I, I've seen the... I've seen the signings that have come in, um, and I've seen that I felt as though that those signings have strengthened the, the team. It needed strengthening, um, and I feel as though 
maybe he's, maybe he's what we're getting is is Bruce actually being able to shape his team. He's got no excuse now because he's he's yeah. he's, saying, he's telling us that these are are, are the sort of people that he wants to come in. Um, going back to going back to that 80, 88, 89 season. Um, if you remember, we, we signed a player who, after twelve games, decided he was homesick and he needed to go back up the Hearts. Um, you know, it was only an hour and a half away on the train, wasn't it? Well, now I thought five back up the back up to Edinburgh. But uh, he, had, he was homesick. I mean, have we ever had anyone uh, as homesick? Well, well, for they, they didn't have Zoom then, then dear Stevie. That, they didn't have Zoom. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the year one still exactly the same, Ian. <laughs> there was less traffic. On this. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we bought, we bought in that season. I mean, we got the. We got Besant, who ended up going to the World Cup in 1990 as one of Aye. the goalkeepers. You know, we had Thorne, who was, you know, probably at the time one of the toughest centre halves um, in the country. You know, he come from Wimbledon, and we've all seen the film, I'm sure. Um, you know, that came out last year or the year before um, about the crazy gang and, and and the part that he played in it. Um, and yet he, he 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 was he was almost constantly injured. Uh, yeah. There was only Hendry that was really a success and eventually went to Borough uh, when Borough turned into a better better team and a better club than than our club at the time after mm. going through the doldrums that they'd had um, when the when they almost went bust, you know. And, I remember uh, the paddle on the gate. Sorry. I remember the padlock on the gate at Ayrshire right. Park. Padlock on the gate, locked mm. out. Played at heart the pool, didn't they? You know, and um, that's how bad things had had got there. But uh, yeah, I mean, so so we're now in a situation where we we've gone out and we're when we've bought what, like you said, right at the start, Steve, we bought a centre forward um, who is established in the Premier League. He might not be the most prolific of goal scorers in the Premier League, man. I think he only scored eight last season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that would that would still make him our top goal scorer based on last yeah, well. season. You know, so let, let's look at that way. And he was playing for a for a Bournemouth team that was right for at that particular time. Um and he's come back from some some injuries, but he's talking the talk. He's, he seems like you know he, he's integrated himself into the squad straight away. He, he's explained why he didn't take the number nine shirt. Um, you know, and maybe that's because he wanted to, to give the confidence back to Joe Linton and, and that type of thing. You know, he didn't want to be someone coming in and being the big Billy Big Boy in the changing room. He's mm -hmm. sort of he's been sensible that way on. Um, I know that Fraser's come and he's carrying a bit of baggage, isn't he? Because of, of for example, what Simon Jordan, who you mentioned earlier, has said about him and what he called him. Um, but the lad, let's face it, he, he's... He had made his decision that he was leaving Bournemouth. Um, was he right or was he wrong not to not to carry on and play um, up through the up through the lockdown um, when you know we got when the game started? I'm not too sure. I, at the time, I thought it, I, you know I, I would have been the sort that would have criticised him if he was playing for my club, and I could understand him not being sort of the most popular person on the on the south coast now, um, but. We know how football football clubs are like, and we know how they protect or otherwise their investments. And he wasn't an investment for them anymore. So whether he, whether they would have even got the insurance for them, because I don't think Bournemouth financially were in a very good are in a very good state of play. And maybe they didn't want to pay. Maybe they wanted to play but not be insured. You just don't know. So um, let's let's see where it takes us. I'm 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 very 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 interested in seeing the young left back Lewis. You know, I mean. No. Saw a little bit of him mm. last season when he was playing for Norwich, but only on match of the day. Norwich didn't have that many live games that we could watch, but he should be fit. He was, he's been with the Repub uh, with the Northern Ireland squad, so he's he's had opportunities to play, and he doesn't sound as though he's the sort of lad who um, picks up knocks. He's young, uh, he'd be enthusiastic, and he and he's he's not he's not exactly small in stature uh, compared no. to some of the left backs that we've had to play. Um, in Danny Rose, for example, or Richie, he's, he he looks he looks quite a height. He looks like an athlete. So uh, you know, from that point of view, I hope that uh, I hope that me, me me sort of me head is 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 in the same place as me heart because me heart are always there for Newcastle. I'm I'm just wondering, is, is that not a place for either the long staffs in in the starting eleven? Good point, Ian. A lot of people asking yeah. that question. Yeah. What about the long staffs? We're, we're, we're a lot of people talking about Matty signing a new contract. Would you like to see him in, uh, Ian? 
Well, I, I mean, I, I'd like this. I think I'd like to see one of them uh, uh, playing. And of course, remember we've we've got the scenario where it's it's only three substitutes now as well. So you know you can't really experiment that much. You've got to put players in that you're more confident in for a ninety minute slog because we haven't got the luxury of having five subs now. Is, is not the case? Yes, mm-hmm. that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I Mitch, would you think, would you play with Longstaff? Is Steve with with Longstaff? Is uh, the old era of the two? Is that he seems to have been developing himself as a bit of a number ten? You know, we've seen him put in some great performances when he's played behind the striker, and I'm just wondering mm-hmm. whether if we want to play the, the two wide men in in Miggy and and Maxi, does that mean that uh, we've got a single centre forward and and one of those is taking up that position? Um, or are we going to play the two holding midfields and give him a position at the top of a diamond with the two wider men? So you, it could well happen. It could well be that, that you know, we don't see Hendricks if it was that formation that I was looking at, um, but we see the two anchor men in Hayden and Shelby, and and then you bring Longstaff in and he plays back just alongside or just behind Wilson with the two guys playing extremely wide, if you like, rather than coming in all the time. So, yeah, mm. I mean, it's a good shout for somebody. Good shout, that. Yeah, Mitch, what about you? Would you like to see Sean Longstaff given um, given an opportunity? I mean, you know, he's proved he's proved he can play in the Premier League. I think it might be a little bit too early yeah. for Matty, but he should still be in, involved around the scenes. I, I, I do think Matty's injured, if I'm if, if I'm not mistaken. But, but yeah, Sean Longstaff, would you give him an opportunity? Well, there's a lot to be said for what the lads have just said about consistency and and playing players that you know and not experimenting too much. Uh, and, and like you rightly say, he seems to have developed himself into this number 10 role, which he had looked good in in, in, in flashes. Um, and again, very similar to where, um, where NFL teams are going to go this weekend with no preseason, what some of them are going to do with rookies who normally may be introduced in a certain way that, that they're all talking about introducing new players in a slightly different way because they've had no preseason. Their first real padded NFL game is going to be when it matters. It's not mm. going to be, um, you know, a, a, a preseason warm-up. And so I think there's a lot to be said for the ex- known, for having a known quantity in your team. Um, so, yeah, it, it, there's certainly a good argument for putting Sean Longstaff in that side. Mm. Yeah, I, I like. I like. I've got to be honest. I like Sean Longstaff. He did a lot to. Uh, he did a lot to prove his doubt as wrong. I, I watched a bit of him in the reserves as well. I think uh, the kid, the, the kid can really develop. You know what I mean? I think if he's given the right kind of coaching, that's the million dollar question, of course, under Steve Bruce. But if he's given the right coaching, I think he could really become a you know a potential England international. And I know that's uh, you know a long way off at the minute, but given the right kind of coaching, he'd do well. And Man United were interested in him. Let's not forget that we're looking to put in a bid in for him, and uh, they they do know a good player when they see one. So it'll be. Interesting. So, yeah. obviously, we've got the cup game coming up, lads. Is the cup game? And again, it's 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 one of those things which we've we've not got used to over the over the last few years. But then suddenly, out of nowhere, Bruce gets an FA Cup run. Steve, um, you know, gets us to the quarterfinals. And you know, he didn't didn't do the right thing against Man City. I think it was ridiculous what he did against them. He, he didn't give it a go. Um, you know, it's always worth a gamble against a team like that, and he didn't gamble. And he just, you know, he, he basically accepted defeat before we kicked the ball. But do you think he's going to give the league cup a go this year? We've got we've got both both draws done now. Ian, go on. You, you want to? I, just, in? I mean, just quickly. I mean, if you if you set your team up to get a draw, the best you're going to get is a draw, and that's a cup game. You know, that's just ridiculous. You know, I mean, that what what, what happened there. And of, and of course we've got we've got a, we've got a home tie against at Blackburn Rovers. So let's 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 have a go for it. You know why not? You know I mean you know what what, what it's not like we're in European competition. We've got a, a relatively well a, a bigger squad now. Anyway, you know it's not a big squad, but we've got a bigger squad. Uh, you know there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of. Uh, uh, baggage there as well, you know, that, that, that you wouldn't necessarily want to carry into the season with you. But we've got a big enough squad to, to, to actually have a go for the mm-hmm. League Cup. We're not, we'll not be in the FA Cup till after Christmas, you know. So, my goodness sake, let's let's um, let, let, let's have a go by this, you know. Mm-hmm. Mitch, fancy it, the League Cup this season, first time since '76. Uh, I'd take out. 
<laughs> you know, at the end of the day, I think right. we all would. Um, right. it, it, it's, that's going to be a strange competition this season because it's, I get the distinct impression it's a competition that some of the very top teams were hoping would be ditched uh, because of circumstances. And therefore, the attitude of the, the clubs involved in Europe, I think, will be very much like, really don't care about this competition. Uh, Liverpool already showed a disservice to it last season when they played a team of kids, when they, when they most certainly could have not. Um, and so I think that says it all, really. This um, strange new, they've done the draw for the next two rounds and it's split into the north and south. Though how Coventry's in the south and Birmingham are in the north, I, I, I don't get that one, but never mind. Mm. Um, you've got to draw your line somewhere, I suppose. Um, couldn't say Sunderland in that draw anyway, mate, but that's another matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and that's bizarre to be in a competition to see them out of before we've even kicked the ball. It's quite, I find that quite baffling. Um, so yeah, why not give it a go? Because the first person to return silverware at the Tyneside since 1969 um, would undoubtedly make themselves a hero, mm. no matter who they were. Mm. Whether yeah. you, whether you think whether you think he's got a cabbage head or not, you, you'd make yourself a hero. So as a, as a in Bruce's position, I can't see any reason why he shouldn't be targeting that competition now, because I don't think even if the stars aligned for them, I don't see any of the the the, the Premier League teams who have European commitments. Um, fielding anything like the first strength, you know, full strength side in this competition, even if it was in a semi final, I don't yeah. get, I don't see it. Uh, but then uh, it, this okay. genuinely could be the one opportunity that's sitting for uh, the club to say, you know, just go for it. Mm. I, I mean, getting a win in habit. You know, it's got to start somewhere. And, and, and I'm yeah. all for trying to get a win in habit. I mean, just play anything as long as you as long as you win. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, just and just keep on trying to win games. You know, I, I mean, we've, we've, we've all been there when it's been really exciting football, trying to win. We're going to score more than you win, you know. But the thing is, getting a win in habit, it never goes wrong. It never goes wrong. It builds the confidence of the team. And even if it's only the League Cup in, in the first instance, just start winning your games. That's all you've got to do. That's what you're put on the pitch for, to win your games. Yep, I agree. Steve, what's your take on the League Cup? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a competition. You've got to go for it. That's what it's about. That's what football's about. It's about competing against the other teams that, that are in the competition with you. You don't, you don't just turn around and go, nah, I'm not going to bother. You know, it's it's there. It's a competition. It's to prove that you have it in you to win. You know, and and it, it, the the whole setup of the League Cup, um, that's what it's about. You know, it's 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 a competition that starts right at the, the beginning of the season. So you've got to be up for it. You've got to be you've got to be prepared and you've got to be ready. Um, mm -hmm. it's a competition where the final comes way before the end of the season. So you've got a bit of excitement to, to to build up to and to generate before you get into that that worrying phase of 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 are we in a relegation position? It's a, it's a competition. That's what football's about. You compete against the teams around you. Yeah, of course yeah. you've got to go for it. And Steve Bruce ends up with a, a, a statue outside St James's Park <laughs> because he's won a trophy. I will be absolutely delighted and I'll probably chip in for it if that's what it is. You know? Stevie will be more likely to be an exeter. <laughs> but you know what, wrong. that's what it's about. That's what the Party United's about, isn't it? You know, uh, yeah. like the heroes now we're looking at, but hey, great. If, honestly, I would be chuffed a bit. I, I don't like the man and the reason I don't like the man is because in 1976, he ended up being the ball, one of the ball boys at the 76th final Oh. Because, because Newcastle FA decided 
and Newcastle schoolboys decided that's how they were going to do it instead of doing the raffle that every other under 15 and under 16 was going to be in right the way through city schools. And you know what? Because he's around about the same age as me. I think that's why people of my age, you know, they go who played football against Benfield when we were at St. Mary's. That's why we don't like. That's the only reason I don't like. I don't have any personal thing about him. But the very fact that he ended up as a ball boy and we didn't get the opportunity. That's why I'm gutted, really. You know? I just pointed for the record, I left St. Mary's in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> you, weren't thrown out, you weren't thrown out. I'll give the people that one. <laughs> Classic. Uh, somebody was asking a question about Arthur Cox and why he left. It was just because he wasn't offered you know, a longer contract. He was offered a short short contract it had nothing to do with Mark Rice that was the reason that uh, that Arthur left I've heard that story many times from yeah. uh, from various people uh, Moxie says some of the big teams start the season later so they'll field a week at 11 in the cup and have um, yeah I think that's a good point I think um Champions mm-hmm. League because it's a, a different format this season again and um, you know the, the, the Premier League will be more of a focus again and a lot of teams will be you know concentrating on that yeah maybe it's the big you know the top six the, the cartel as we've been calling them over the last few weeks will uh, will not maybe take it as seriously you know but um, it might give might give us a chance another another thing I want to talk about the Nads we're, we're into the last half hour I must mention this as well because I've got a, I've got a horrendous habit of forgetting things we're now um, on iTunes and Spotify so if you do happen to miss the YouTube program or you're out cutting the grass or walking the dog or whatever you whatever you're doing um you can uh, just search any UFC matters on iTunes and Spotify and all the shows that we've done previously are all on there so you can listen on your headset your phone whatever uh, so we are on there and now we have got a few thing I was Steve well, no, it just means you don't have to look at this as well, which is a bonus, you know. <laughs> no, you don't have to, you, have to sing. I you don't, to clear everybody off, you know. You don't, <laughs> and you don't have to sing. I'm on the radio, Steve. I was made to do that thing. <laughs> um, and we we'll have, as I say, we all still load the shows on. You must have a watch of this one, which I did yeah. this afternoon, which was an absolute belter with Bruce Durham, good pal of mine from the boxing world, but who did the body language analysis of uh, Richard Masters, and we also did some analysis of Mike Ashley and Amanda Stavely on that show. So um, have a look at that, and then have a look at his uh, his channel, Believe in Bruce. We had a great chat yesterday as well. What happens next? The NUFC takeover, me and the lads, and uh, a couple of guests. Liam Kennedy, uh, of course, was on there. And if um, you, if you like a bit of swearing and a bit of Geordie Shaw, then uh, tune into this one. Um, it's complete expletives all the way. He was doing his hair all the time. And but listen, Marty McKenna's a Newcastle fan like the rest of us. He's a good laugh. Plenty on the channel. Have a look. Please subscribe. Please like the videos. Please share them. And uh, of course, tomorrow. We'll be back again, um, you know, after the game, as, as long as Steve and Mitch are up for it, just to, to chat about the game after the game and, and, you know, hopefully talk about three points to, to Newcastle after the West Ham game. But uh, last half an hour, I want to talk about the number nine shirt. Um, obviously, everyone was expecting Wilson to sign Mitch, get the number nine shirt off Joe Linton, mm. but it didn't It didn't happen. He's took number 13, which, of course, is the shirt that he wore at Bournemouth, and everybody, everyone was expecting him to take the nine, but the 13 obviously means something to him. Um, but were you surprised that Joe Linton's kept a hold of it? Yes and no. Um, you know, it, 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 Wilson obviously has a thing for number 13, and that's fine. Um, I think he spoke very eloquently about not taking a shirt off of a, 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 a fellow team member. Um, wonder if it was even discussed. It seems to weigh heavy on Joe Linton's shoulders, but you never know. Behind the scenes, Joe Linton may be turning around saying, no, I want to want to prove I can play with this shirt on my back. I would hope so, because that would that would actually show he's got a bit about him that we've not really seen. Um, so it's really, really difficult to weigh it up. The, the other aspect as well these days in the era of squad numbers, and it, 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 numbers are just numbers now. If you look at the look at the madness in some leagues where you've got, you know, your left back wearing ninety two and your centre forward seventy four because it's the FM frequency of a sponsored radio station in Brazil somewhere. Um I think numbers have lost their meaning to a lot of players, and that's just the change in the game. Um and and I, and we've got the 
we're transitioning. You know, we, every football generation sees change in how the attitude of, of the new generation is to the game. You know, think of the the lads and used to run around in butchers' coats and what they used to say of us and my Pringle jumpers and my Farah State Press. You know, <laughs> it, it's it's that sort of transition. We've got the FIFA generation now who are obsessed with stats. Sometimes stats that are, frankly, in my opinion, bloody useless. Um, and squad numbers are just squad numbers. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, again, a little because I've got a, a, a you know big interest in the NFL. I'm used to squad numbers. And, and so it's something I, I, that I'm very, very used to. Um, but even the squad numbers in American football actually do relate to positions if you break it down. There are, you know, certain players playing certain positions can only have certain numbers. Um, whereas now, a lot of people will be looking at it and going, what's the fuss? It's just a number. Mm. And I think I think maybe it's, it's that may show me age a little bit. I don't know. Because um, that number nine shirt still means a hell of a lot to me. Uh, yeah. and, and a hell of a lot to most of work. Um, and but perhaps even some of the modern players don't look at it the same way as well. I'm, I'm wondering though, Neil. I mean, that um, if like in, in the states, you know, there were like clubs retire shirts there in honour yes, of particular players. Man, yep. it, you know, well, surely the number nine would have been retired already at Newcastle, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah like, absolutely, would have been. Yeah. Long ago. <laughs> Shearer wouldn't have got a number nine, would he? Well, probably <laughs> no, not. Probably I mean, wouldn't. I mean, it could have been retired with Jackie Milburn. It could have been retired, you know. I mean, I, I wish I wish, I wish, wish McDonald had stayed longer instead of going to Arsenal for £333,000, you know. And, but I mean, you know. 3333 <laughs> And 33 pence. <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe Linton retired it last season for me. I, I didn't really yeah. see much of it. I made it. He certainly didn't have to wash it. Um, Steve, I think the number, you know, Steve, the I number think, nine. I think, I think if, the, the thing with the number nine shirt is it's not until you go, like if some of the young'uns went to a talking that you ran, right? Yep. And you've got and you've got a you've got a David Kelly there, or you've got a Mickey Quinn, and they start talking about the club and they start talking about the pride that they had from twenty right. years ago or twenty seven year ago. Of, of wearing that black and white shirt, first of all, but then having the added pride of knowing that they wore the number nine because it was right. special to them. And so perhaps I, I, we've had this discussion a few times, haven't we, Steve, about whether or not you will run talkings with any of the current squad in 20 years' time. Will Joe yep. Lynch be coming back and you'll be having them at the Hilton Hotel or you'll be having them at the Cumberland Arms or somewhere like that to do a talking? It's not going to happen, you know? No. And, and there's very few players that you would probably want to do a talk in with. But what I'm getting at is that those those lads from years ago, they they got Newcastle United. They got they got the pride of wearing the black and white shirt first. We saw them put performances in in that black and white shirt, and they were lucky enough to also do it wearing the number nine. And that in itself makes the number nine shirt iconic. And it makes it special. People, some some players own the number nine. You know, Mal Malcolm owned the number nine. Um, Jack Win Davies. Number nine, you know, Shira owned the number nine. Oberfemi Martins didn't own the number nine. <laughs> you know, you know, um, it's that's the, that's the difference. You've got to go out and you've got to show that passion, and then with with it becomes the pride. And with it becomes the adulation, and with it becomes the iconic status that the shirt gives you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether I don't know whether modern players and and like as Neil says it, and and perhaps younger fans understand that, and they understand what that's what football is about. It's not just about the performance today, or the performance tomorrow, or the poor performance and the good performance, or the superstar goal, the spectacular. It's about the, the, the big package. It's about the whole package. And with us, in our age, and, and people around us, that's where the number nine becomes the iconic thing with Newcastle United. 
The, the thing is, though, Steve, the thing is, though, Steve, right, you know, you, you've mentioned about four or five number names that we all remember fondly, but there's plenty that we didn't mean. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> what I mean. There's plenty that we mm. don't, you know. Yeah. And the, the ones that I'm talking about are the ones that Steve will do the talkings from. But, the ones that we're not talking about are the ones that Steve will never do talkings with. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I noticed you didn't mention George Rayleigh or Billy Whitehurst, you know what no, I mean? So. No. <laughs> he, here's, here's the thing. Although Steve, Steve has done, I'm sure he has done talkings with Billy Whitehurst before, but that's probably right. more to do with Billy Whitehurst, the character, than Billy Whitehurst, right. the footballer. <laughs> right. Here's the thing, though. Would some of those be remembered, I wouldn't say more fondly, but um, with less pessimism? If they hadn't won the number nine, would things have been recognised about them that haven't been recognised? I because they, so, because they couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. So, or the so it became an the cross was, from their neck. Yeah, yeah. you know yeah. It, because the only goal they scored was with their arse when they were <laughs> looking in the opposite direction or off their knee, shin right. roller into the top corner. You know, um, it, it's. It, it it is I guess it's that blessing stroke curse that the number nine shirt in Newcastle United could be Aye. for the wrong player at the wrong time. But we have been rewarded, haven't we, Neil? We've been rewarded Aye. with people who not only have worn the number nine shirt, but, but have actually it's performed it's with, with that particular yeah. shirt on their back, you know. Yeah. Alan, obviously, Alan Shearer is the first one that comes to mind from the from from the the, the, the modern day game. Um, but then Malcolm, you know, because of the lads that you know that were at our school age, that what what signing a, a bloke like Malcolm with the charisma he had for one hundred and eighty thousand pounds, you know what that meant at that particular time, and to have someone come in and the first thing he did. Was score a hat trick in his debut, you know? Yes, Liverpool. His home debut. Liverpool home debut. Sorry, yes, home yeah. debut. You know, the f you know the first one being a penalty brought down by a man who became probably another one of our iconic heroes, Kevin Keegan. You know, right. um, you know how the how the stars align sometimes is is amazing. You know, but that's football. That's the that's the excitement of football. That's what football is all about. You know, um. To my dad's era, it was Jackie Milburn, you know, um, Jackie wearing the shirt. To his, to his grandfather, it, it was Huey Gallagher. Huey you Gallagher. Know? And, 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 it, and it comes through and it comes in cycles. Um, is, is Joe Linton going to be my nephew's hero? Probably not. Is my, does, does Sonny understand what the number nine shirt means unless he's... Unless Jed's going to like instill it into him over the over the next season, you know, as it as it becomes special, or is it just going to be like you say, Neil, uh, uh, a situation that's a throwaway thing because of that that particular generation? Because we're hanging on to something. Maybe as if we won a cup. Maybe as if we won something, we wouldn't need to hang Aye. on to the, 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 the number nine shirt as being the big thing. Maybe as it would be the person who held up or scored the goal in the cup final that would be the thing that we would suddenly hang on to, you know? Um, who knows? Aye. Aye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Peter Barnett suggesting that you sing uh, the Bob Dylan song live when the takeover is completed, Steve. Uh, we might have to wait a few more months for that, like, but I think you better give you a bit. I'll, I'll get the song book out now then. <laughs> it, 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 it gives you a bit more uh, time to practice that. Uh, yeah, time Mark, to practice, we are. Peter Mark Sanders. Peter's probably heard me drink, uh, sing on a on a Wednesday night in some of the bars in Newcastle when I've been out with him before many many years ago when he was at the post office. So I, I'm, I'm, I think Peter Peter doesn't know what he's going to let himself in for if I suddenly start to sing like I used to then days. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, Steve. You know, in the current context, I hope it's not going to be a hard rain's going to fall. Like uh, it's going to be. A, <laughs> it, it is your love in vain? I think that's probably what it'll end up with. <laughs> to be honest, to be honest, on Twitter, I did put a request out for songs that summed up the takeover. I'm currently working my way through about 165 songs that people have sent us, so I've got a nice little playlist there for the takeover. There's some some cracking tracks and a lot of imagination's gone into it. Um, look at look into this season, and where do you think we're going to finish, Mitch? Um, you know, what's what's your what's your gut instinct before a ball's kicked? What's with, your what's your gut instinct? Where's Newcastle United going to finish this season? With the additions to the squad we've got. Um, we surely should be able to improve on last year. 
we should be looking to be finishing in the upper half of the table. We shouldn't be looking at number 17 being success. Um, a lot's going to matter on how we start. Can we hit the ground running and, and start to get some points in the bag early? Mm. Which the form at the tail end of last season would suggest isn't going to happen. Um, but we, we do have impetus in the squad and all the players who've been added, I would say, improve the squad. And so we've, we've got the ability there to be saying, okay, top 10 and take it from there. Um, I'm having a hard head battle with that, though, given that I'm not a big fan of the style of football that the manager plays and, and not the manager's biggest fan either. So, you know, that, that's, the, that's the difficulty I have with this. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's the age-old thing about f- it looks great on paper, but that's but football's played on grass, you know. Mm. Um, so, uh, but we've, we've certainly got the ability to finish in the top half of the league with the squad we've got now. Okay, so, so go on, Daniel, where are you things. going? There's a couple of things, Steve. I mean, first and foremost, how many penalties did we get, did we get last season? Count them I mean, on what, one hand, I think. I, well, I, I was, it was probably only a couple, Two, right? I think. And, Right. Right. And, and, and so and so therefore from that perspective you can't have a season like that again and and, and I think you know it, it, as long as the players that we've got play honestly I think you know a mid table top off finish is not beyond us but it, do we get the, do we get the rub of the green you know because it's quite clear there's some people in in the game who don't, don't seem to like us as a club they don't seem to like our fans uh, and maybe I'm a conspiracy theorist from that perspective but you know, um, you know, if 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 those if those greater powers are against you, I, I, I wouldn't rule anything in. I would rule anything out. Uh, but if we get a fair over the green, I think mid table top off. Okay, so that's both of you. It's going to be top off, Steve. Are you going the same? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm ten to twelve. Ten to twelve. That's where I'm sitting. I think mm-hmm. um, I think that uh, steady in the ship. Is is probably the least I'm expecting from from Steve Bruce in terms of of being able to start to conjure up some results against teams that he couldn't last season. Um, I know that we ended up with a, a fair few points, um, but the performances were, were the things that I felt let us down um, and disappointed a lot of us. And um, I'm I'm erring on the side of a ten to twelve. That 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 squad should be should be good enough. Uh, to get us into 10th to 12th position. Um, we certainly should be comfortable. We shouldn't be into a relegation battle or anything like that. And the the, the caveat that I'm going to throw in is that I'm hoping that the takeover, if it, if it does happen uh, between now and Christmas, gives us the opportunity to give them that little bit financial uh, impetus to, to, to secure a few more quality players in the January transfer window. And, and to cement our position, first of all, to make sure that we do stay for the following season in the Premiership, but also give us a good platform for taking us into, into the following season. Because that, that, all of that, that, that's continuous improvement. At the least you would expect from a football team and from a manager is continuous improvement, improving on where you were, especially a manager like, like Steve Brooks, you know, with 20-odd years of experience. I'm hoping with the backing that he's already received, that we can have that continuous improvement based on where he was in his first season, which we all know was a very, very difficult season for him, coming in as he did very, very late on. And with everything, that the, the whole Rafa scenario that had built up um, at that point. So we'll give, him, we'll give him the chance now. He's got the opportunity to be able to take the football club forward, take the team forward, start to play the sort of football that he says he can play, that he's expecting of, of of the squad. He's these are people that he's, you know, that this isn't this isn't a squad that's that that's been thrown at him again. You know, it's not like that, you know, Steve Nixon's gone out and says you're gonna have X, Y, and Z, you know. Yeah, this is the team that he says he's had input into. You know, these are the buys that he's looking for. These are the people he wants to strengthen the squad. So great, excellent. That's what we want. We want a manager with that enthusiasm to take that enthusiasm now into the performance, and that's what that's what we're looking for. Somebody asked about earlier about body language. Um, I've had an itchy nose for about the last twenty five minutes. I'm frightened to scratch it. To be perfectly honest, I'm frightened to even <laughs> <put> nose. <laughs> 
Andy James is asking you a question, Ian. He says, if the PIF and uh, Saudi Arabia link is based on Saudi law, how can the Premier League claim to be taking legal advice on the links unless they are claiming to be talking to Saudi lawyers? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I really don't know. I really don't know. Is that the bear trap, you think? <laughs> <laughs> Could be somebody. Somebody asked what the bear trap was, Steve. Do you, can you can you elaborate what you think it is? Yeah, I, I think it's something like that. I think it's something like, for example, they want you to they want you to say something, they want you to commit to something that you know you cannot commit to. Mm-hmm. And I or think is, or is yourself, factually untrue. Yes, yes, something that can then be dismantled. Something that somebody's already got something on you with. Mm. So they lead you down a path for you to say or you to agree something with, and they're already sitting there with the ammunition that they can then destroy uh, you with. That's well, fair. I think I said a few weeks ago, Steve, a few weeks ago, I was saying this, that if the Premier League were looking for something, a hitch, you know, it, it would end up being the way in which the feds got Al Capone. You know, he killed people. He was a drug runner, a bootlegger. But what did they get him for? Tax evasion. And it'll be something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's as simple as that, isn't it? I mean, and I think this is, I think we're starting to piece it all together, lads. You know, we all chat offline and away from the show when, you know, before we come on air. But I think we're, I think we're starting to get to the crux of this now. And it's, it, it, it is as simple as that, you know, hopefully, hopefully, um, you know, Mike Ashley can, can find a resolve to this with his lawyers. And, uh, you know, I think the positives are, I think we know that Mike Ashley still wants to sell the club and, and we've still got willing buyers. And until, until we hear from them, we've just got to concentrate really on, on what's happening on the pitch and hope that Steve Bruce has got enough, um, you know, ideas and skills to, uh, to, to keep Newcastle United up again. That's got to be, uh, you know, I haven't given my prediction. I, I, I do think you're pretty much right. I think mid-table's, mid-table's achievable as long as we, you know, as long as we don't have a bad run with injuries and as long as Ian says, as long as we get rubber the green with the officials, which we clearly haven't over the years. So let's hope that we do get a little bit of rubber the green. Lady looks shining down on us and we can, you know, we can hopefully, you know, have a have a half-decent season. It would be great. And a run in the Cups would be good as well because as Ian again said earlier, Winning breeds, you know, winning games, it breeds confidence and, and you know, ultimately it gets us through. But we want Newcastle to do well. What What's your predictions for tomorrow's game then? Um, Mitch, come to you first. West Ham away. I think we mentioned a little bit earlier in the week when we did that impromptu show. West Ham's in a bit of turmoil. Um, yep. what, what's, your, what's your feeling for tomorrow's game? Exactly. And just we're playing them a really nice time. Um, in a soulless stadium, which isn't going to have fans in it. Mm-hmm. Internally, that club captains criticised the, the the management of the club and the running of the club about letting younger players go. Um, I gather they're carrying a few injuries as well, so I think that's a perfect time to go and give it a go, get the ground running. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, let's let's give them the game. Let's go at them. You, you were right about. I think was it Shelby had a blinder down there last season. Mm-hmm. He did. Let's see him again. See him again. Bring it on. And we've got, what have we got to lose? We've got great spirit in the camp by the looks of things. You know, take over Matt, as I say, there, there seems to be a good good feeling in that squad with these new additions. So unleash him. Let's go. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Steve, your prediction? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree entirely with what Mitch has just said. And I also add that the other part of the turmoil is that they, they've had a player on their books in, in Jack Wilshire. Who they're now trying to to to, to buy off and and and, and offload and terminate his contract with. So when what does that say to the rest of the squad? You know, you've got rid of a youngin um, that, that, that 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 the club captains criticised you for, and now we're in a situation where we've got we've got someone who's still relatively young and and, and talented, um, and they're trying to get they're trying to get rid of him in in, in that respect. And when it when a when a club gets into that situation, it becomes public. That yeah yeah you're trying to get a player to terminate his contract and you're trying to pay him off because you feel as though he's not he's not the person for you, um, and this is West Ham. This is a Premier League. This is a this is a club that could go out and could buy a replacement for Jack Wilshere tomorrow if they wanted because so we're led to believe that they're you know they're, they're run by you know a, a couple of charlatan uh, millionaires that with that with money to burn. 
you know they've, they've got a they've got a ground that they pay something like two million pound for uh, a season for rent. You know they 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 conned they conned the British government. You know they they played an absolute blind that they get that stadium, didn't they? You know absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. Um and and it's a sixty thousand and the fans hate it. Everything mm -hmm. about what's going on at West Ham, the dislike. It's great, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I'll bring that. I'll, I'll bring that three note. I'd love that three note. I, I, I'll take what I'll take what the lad said before. Three nil away win. Three nil. What a great start the season that would be. Ian, I'm just gonna I'm gonna come to you for your prediction. I've got to laugh at this one. Joe Linton will probably dye his hair claret and blue for the game. Yeah, that's, I think that's a that's a that's a gonna be one of the funniest comments I've seen tonight. Ian, um, go on. What's your prediction? Well, I'm, I'm I'm very much hoping that the West Ham fans will be bubbling at the end of that one. But 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 I think it really, from my perspective, does depend on really one player. As long as he has a reasonable game, will be all right. That's that's the goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Like that's good. Yeah, it's good. It's good to be safe. I think um, I'm going to go for an entertaining game. I kind of see us winning. I, I do think there'll be goals in the game, like there was last season. I'm going to go for an entertaining two-two draw. I'll settle for a point down there. I know we should be chasing all three, but I genuinely feel like that there'll be goals tomorrow. I think I think a lot of the predictions are three-nil, three-one. A lot of people feeling that Newcastle are going to get a win down there. I hope they do. I've just got a feeling that it could be a draw, could be a bit of VAR controversy. Uh, it never goes smoothly for Newcastle. It could be two 0 up and then end up two two. It's it's got a, it's got a feeling it could be one of those games. Uh, tomorrow I am going to I am going to be uh, around watching the game. So uh, a lot of people asking if we can do a live chat when the game's on. I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to just to let, let the stream go on and uh, I can be talking about it. I know the lads are going to come on after the game. Uh, I'll have a chat with them, see if they fancy join, joining this and doing that tomorrow. That could be entertaining. And uh, me, me, me and the lads, uh, ooh and an hour and when the game's on. So, Steve, Mitch, I'll have a chat with you about that. I'm sure Mitch will be in the pub as well, which will be even funnier. Aye. Um, but uh, but yeah, let's see, let's see. I'll 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 certainly open. I'll, I'll certainly have a look at that and see whether that's possible. But uh, as always, I hope you're not inviting me. I'll be compass mentors. <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry about that. It's been great. Listen, it's always good to have you on, Ian. And um, you know, as I say, from from our perspective and the watchers, you know, the viewers' perspective, everyone has enjoyed, you know, your input again. And thanks for for coming on for the for the full two hours the night as well. You know, yeah, it's been a pleasure, pleasure. Good, good stuff. Um, a lot of people asking before we go as well about the uh, the goal scorers. Now, obviously, they don't have a great deal to beat, so we'll make this the last question, Mitch. Um, the top goal scorer, who, who do you think is going to bang the goals in this season? Yeah, it's got to be Wilson, isn't it? You know? Yep. Okay, Steve? Right, yeah, absolutely. We've just spent £20 million on him and given him £100,000 a week. So <laughs> yeah. we're not putting any pressure on if him, are If he's not know? the top goal scorer, there's something wrong. <laughs> right, we're not putting any pressure on him. If, if, if Callum Wilson doesn't score as many goals as Joe Linton, then there's going to be questions yeah. in the house, Ian. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, the thing is, I, I think we should give Joe Linton a clean slate this this season. Now, I've got I've got this theory. There are certain players who it takes them a full year to bed in to to get up to the to to, to the pace of the game in the Premier League, but also. Because you've got an out and out straight hour, Callum Wilson, he may be playing in a more comfortable position for him personally. So I'll say that Callum Wilson will be the top scorer, but I think Joe Wilson might get half a dozen this season. Yeah, I'm telling you now, I'm going to give, I, I'm going to follow Mernsey's uh, advice there, right? As me local MP, I'm going to give me, I'm going to give, I'm going to give Joe Linton the benefit of the doubt, right? Starting now. Right, and we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens as the season progresses. This is going to go well. I <laughs> you're right. At the end of October. I tell you what, it could all be over by next Friday, sure, but we'll, you'll, see. You'll, we'll see. By October, you'll be wearing a mask. You'll be scared <laughs> to step out your house. You'll never be seen. You... <laughs> there you go. That's, Ian's got it on. Other, other masks are available. <laughs> <laughs> all right i hope everyone has a great night thanks uh, everybody for watching and uh, jo john just said steve's body language when saying he's given joe a chance exactly yeah. exactly i will give him a chance because everyone's saying i should stop I ribbing him so i've seen you scratching your nose <laughs> <laughs> great stuff as always thanks for joining us lads and i uh, look forward to seeing mitch and steve after the game tomorrow ian thanks a lot mate and thanks everybody for watching take care good night cheers everybody cheers Bye -bye. everyone Bye -bye. speak soon take care.